Amen. Well, singing uh, sounds awesome. I do want to lift up uh, Jason Massaman for uh, hosting a song practice yesterday, man. So getting back to that. And uh, also, uh, it was awesome to see all the birthdays up here. It was our Shepherd Stan's birthday in January also this month, amen. But uh, we recognize Joe's because his was specifically today. Um, and uh, also, uh, just another announcement is that there will be a leaders meeting for the Bible Talk leaders uh, back here at 2 p.m., amen? Awesome. Let's say a word of prayer. Amen. Father, thank you so much for the ways you've loved us. Uh, God is, uh, you know, uh, Jason talked about the five love languages, Father. Uh, God, I pray that we can love you, God, in that language, God, that our faith pleases you and our worship is something that, that God uh, uh, honors you today. Father, I pray as we get in the word, and as the word is just preached, God, help me to preach it in an unfiltered way, to, to just lay out what the scriptures teach with no fear or anything like that, God. I pray that uh, for those who are comfortable to be disturbed, and for those that are disturbed to be comforted. And uh, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit leads us and convicts us. Thank you for this incredible church. I want to pray specifically for those who are visiting with us today, God, that are studying the Bible and wrestling with making big decisions, God. I pray that your spirit pushes them, God, to the waters of baptism. We love you and we thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, how many of you guys want to change the world? How many of you guys want to change the world? There we go. Amen. You know, I love being a Christian because being a Christian is not just about being a nice person. Being a Christian is about having a global impact. And when Jesus called you to follow him, you said, I'm going to leave everything to be a fisher of men. Amen. And it's amazing when we see souls get saved. People go to AA. They go to counseling. They read psychology books. And things that people are wrestling with overcoming for years, in a moment, the gospel destroys those chains and gives them life and gives them hope. And we get to be used as God's vessels to bring this message to that lost world. Amen. We've got to start off in Matthew chapter 28. Let's turn over there. What is God's plan to win this world? Matthew chapter 28 and in verse 18 says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You know, Jesus didn't come to just build a church here in Riverside, a church here in San Bernardino, a church here in Colton. Jesus came to build a global church filled with all nations. And I love it. You know, I'm excited for uh, Gearbo. Eventually, we're going to get that speaking Spanish, uh, Spanish speaking service going. Amen. And I think that'll be awesome. But you know, it's sad. There are churches in this city that are all Spanish speaking churches only, all Korean churches. And that is unbiblical. Because the church should reflect the demographics of the city. Amen. If you're in Mexico, yes, that, that makes sense. If you're in Korea, that makes sense. But in a city like this, I love the kingdom of God because you look around and you see the diversity. Yes. And, and that represents God's kingdom. Now, how are we going to get to all nations? God calls us to get to all nations. How are you going to get to every country in this world? Well, he says, you got to go meet someone, make a disciple, baptize that person. Their life's changed. But then in verse 20, it says, you are commanded to stay with them and to mentor them. Wow, the Bible says to teach them to obey. Amen. Amen. And the title of the lesson is Discipling, God's Plan to Win the World. Amen. <laughs> discipling. You know, if you're visiting with us, we are called the Sold Out Discipling Movement. Because we are a church that is restoring biblical Christianity. And one of the things that's been lost is this idea of one-on-one -on -one discipleship that we find in the Bible. And discipleship is the glue of God's kingdom. Yes, it is. 
This is why God never intended to build just some autonomous church and have 10 different churches in the same city all working separately. No, one disciple makes another disciple. There's a relationship there. There's a bond there. That disciple makes another disciple. There's a relationship there. There's a bond there. And as the movement grows, it's incredible because that discipling is what glues us all together in God's kingdom. And so as we go through this lesson today, I want you to consider what are your convictions on discipleship? And what are your convictions on meeting with your discipleship partner? Amen. So in our church, since we follow the Bible, every single person that gets baptized has a discipling partner because Jesus commanded us to do that. Amen. Amen. Every Christian is to baptize. I was telling someone earlier today, you know, sadly, in most churches, it's only the pastor that baptizes. Well, you can right away know that's not a biblical church because every Christian's commanded to baptize Come someone. On, right? Amen. Every Christian's commanded to go out there and participate in the work of spreading the gospel around the world. And I love discipleship. You know, this is why Jesus came to this earth from heaven. And if he was just to die for our sins, and that was it, he could have just done that real fast. I mean, Adam was created as a grown man. Jesus could have come as a grown man, died, and it'd be done. But he spent 33 years on this earth because he understood that we need to see someone live out Christianity. Now, in our time, Jesus is not bodily here on the earth in that same sense. And yet Jesus had a plan. Discipleship. And this is why if you turn to John chapter 1. In John chapter 1. This is going to sound blasphemous, what I'm about to say. So... If you're religious and you're visiting with us, just hang in there and I'll show you the video. All right? But the Bible is not enough to save you. It's not. John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, the word must become flesh in people's lives. Meaning, you may be the only Bible they ever read by watching your life. And the Bible is sitting on thousands and thousands of American shelves this morning. Collecting dust. It's sitting in the room of atheist professors who teach world religion classes. And yet, that's not having an impact. I grew up, the Bible sitting on the shelf there collecting dust. Heard some of the stories. That didn't change my life. In fact, I went to a Baptist church. That had no impact in my life. It was when a disciple came into my life and I saw the scriptures lived in their lives that I go, oh my gosh, there's power there. And now I can know how to walk like Jesus because I see Christ in another person. And this is Jesus' plan to win the world. Are you with me right here? You see, Jesus commands us to teach each other to obey. And that is very different than teaching someone the Bible. If you want to learn the Bible, you can go on YouTube. You can go to seminary. And you can learn deep things that, 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 that are beyond even anything any of us know, no matter what degree you have. There are some very smart people out there. And yet, to be taught to obey, that's a lot more challenging. It's kind of like having a kid. You know, if you have kids and you want them to obey, you could go, imagine in Kids Kingdom, for example, in our our children's class, if they just, like, hang up a poster and they go, hey, kids, for the kids that can read, here's the rules, um, and just follow them. Is that going to work? No. No. See, the, the rules were enough to save them. The rules need to be emulated through example, but enforced through encouragement, positive reinforcement, correction, and rebuke. And this is why 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, all scriptures from God. We are a Bible-based church. And we're going to preach some things from the Bible that are a little counter to our culture today. So put your seatbelt on. But being part of a Bible-based church then, sometimes you're going to have to use the Bible to correct, rebuke, encourage, instruct with great patience. You know, in our congregation, everyone has a discipling partner 
And how do we implement obeying all the one another passages that are in the Bible? Love one another. Confess your sins to one another. Well, there's got to be structure. There's got to be order. In every family, there's, a, there's rules and there's a system, if you will, to implement things. And as church leaders, we are to speak where the Bible's silent. Amen? Amen? And I love the Bible. God gives us a lot of freedom. He gives us the rules. He says, go evangelize the world. But then we got to figure out, like, where to meet for church, don't we? We've got to figure out what time to come together and all that kind of stuff. They go, well, where in the Bible does it say that we got to meet on Sunday at 10 a.m.? I want to meet at Sunday at 12 p.m., right? <laughs> well, amen. Leadership comes into play and discipleship. Yeah. Hebrews 13, 17 says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. This doesn't mean you submit to them if they want you to wear, dress a certain way or whatever. We're not talking about that. We're talking about... The church is to submit to direction leadership gives according to the Bible for unity. And so discipling is key when it comes to our unity as a church and our unity as a congregation. Um, I didn't learn to change a tire on a car by reading the manual. Could have, maybe. Is it possible? Certainly. But I watched my dad do it first, and then he showed me how to do it, and then I learned it from him. That's discipleship, amen? So what we've decided in our congregation is everyone has a discipling partner, and our expectation as a leadership is that they meet with their discipleship partner once a week. And they have a time of strengthening in the Bible. And one, the reason I'm doing this teaching now is because that's been a lot of chaos with the winter workshop and transition, and we're still getting organized in a lot of ways. But now, for the most part, all the discipling is set in the church, amen? And so I think this is a great week to kick off great discipleship partner times amen? amen and i find it sad when christians they kind of neglect discipleship partner times They're like well you got to go to church on sunday mornings but yeah we can just kind of blow off the d time this week well we need the discipleship time don't we amen. what's the theology behind discipling you ever think deeply about this god is in his very nature a relational being I love in the Bible, it says, let us, in Genesis 1, create man in our image. There's a plurality there. And we understand that God is a plurality with God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he made men in his image in a sense of plurality. And so we are made in the image of God, thus we need relationships. And I think God and the Father and the Son, and you read about this relationship they share in the book of John, it's just so powerful that they just needed to pour out that love on someone else, and so they created us, amen? amen. And they invite us to walk in that relationship. Jesus had a discipling relationship, and it was with his Father, God. And you go, well, that's not fair. They were, they were equal. Well, sort of. Let's go, in, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and as you're turning there, I, I just want to share, rattle off some uh, discipling relationships in the Bible that I think are fun to study out. You've got, uh, of course, the first discipling occurs in the marriage, amen? The husband disciples his wife, amen. and we'll talk about that here a little bit. But also we find Moses discipled Joshua, Samuel discipled Saul, Samuel also discipled David, Nathan discipled David. Jesus discipled the 12, but even within the 12, he discipled more specifically Peter, James, and John. Uh, Barnabas discipled Paul, and then Paul rose up <laughs> uh, uh, more than Barnabas, and so that relationship shifted to where Paul discipled Barnabas. And you, there's a direct shift in the book of Acts there. And that's always awesome. A great discipler's goal is he wants the people he leads to raise up and do greater things Amen. than he does. And that's my heart being here. I want to see people raise up and do even greater things. Are you with me right here? And that was Barnabas, the son of encouragement's heart in the Bible. Of course, Paul discipled Timothy, discipled Silas. I mean, he discipled a host of different men. Peter discipled John Mark. Um, I mean, it's amazing. And discipling is God's perfect plan. And it's amazing. God uses imperfect people in his perfect plan. And if you really think deeply about it, it actually makes sense. Because it requires a lot more faith, trust. And humility to submit to a human being that's imperfect. You have to like really trust God. And for a lot of us to go, well, I trust God. I just don't trust my leader. You're going to see today that actually doesn't work. 
And I'm not saying they're perfect or you have to, you know, do everything they say if it's unbiblical or anything like that. So forget that. That is not what we're talking about today. I'm saying when you trust God, you trust the people he's put in your life. And, and, And it requires qualities, faith, trust, humility, and submission. I think we get faked out. The discipleship study we do in the church as our first principles series is not really about discipleship. It's really about just how to become a Christian. Discipleship is more about followership, following someone. What Jesus did when he called his original followers in Mark chapter 1 is he said, hey, come walk with me and I'm going to make you into something. I'm going to mentor you. I'm going to coach you. So I find the word I like to use to kind of view discipleship is mentorship. That's kind of the modern word we use a lot. And even the world understands mentorship in in a great way. If you want to get wealthy, you're going to want to try to find wealthy people to be around that can teach you and mentor you in their ways. Amen? And so part of discipling then is walking with Jesus and seeing a living and breathing example and then being that to others that we disciple. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Paul writes this to the church. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I like the King James. It says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Verse 2, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions as I pass them on to you. Do you know there's traditions in the church? Yeah. It kind of throws us off a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. He's praising them for holding on to traditions. See, we understand from Matthew 15, traditions that go against the Bible when it comes to salvation are wrong. That's false doctrine. But here he's talking about traditions like customs, things that that they do to be orderly. It'd be like for us, a tradition is we meet at 10 a.m. here at the Comfort Inn. He says, I praise you for holding on to that direction. But he wants to disciple them a little bit. Now, some context here. You had some women in the church who started getting a little rally, okay? They started getting a little out of of control. Uh And there was a a movement, there was a movement uh, in in Rome at the time called the New Women Movement. And this was similar to our our feminist movement today. And uh, back then, you would wear a head covering um, in this culture as a symbol of of you being married. So it'd be kind of like our wedding ring today. What this new women movement advocated was removing that and shaving your head, which a lot of promiscuous women did back at that time, known as like Corinthian girls. We'll talk about this more in our Corinthian series. Um, And so they were coming to church, the wives, in a sense, without their wedding ring on, if you will. Now, if you forgot it this morning or took out, don't, don't, you know, feel some type of way. (laughs) This was intentional. And they were just being promiscuous and independent and woman power and all this stuff. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 addresses this and you understand it always starts with the husband not discipling his wife and there's an ordering of relationships in the church and everything in our culture is teaching against this today so first corinthians 11 verse 3 but i want you to realize that the head of every man is christ and the head of every woman is man and the head of christ is god so even there's an ordering in the trinity God is the head of Christ. You're not a Trinitarian church. What's going on? No, we are. They're equal, but there's an ordering. And we need to understand in the marriage that emulates that discipling relationship, there's equality because we're all equal before the foot of the cross. But there's an ordering. I have authority over my wife. And and, and, amen. She's fired up about it. (laughs) He goes, she's sitting in the back because you're preaching this, you know, today. No. <laughs> Our daughter's sick, and so she had to stay out of sit- Kids Kingdom and sit in the back with her. Amen? But, you know, for me as the preacher of the church, God's given me authority over the church. Yeah. Amen. But I'm equal with you at the foot of the cross. I'm not, like, better than you or anything like that. It's just simply the ordering of roles. And this world will tell you to get rid of all of that. Well, just look at the world and see how that's working. Yeah. Doesn't work, does it? But we need to start, if we're going to talk about discipling, and our first point is discipling involves servitude. Come on, but, but before I get into the servitude thing, we need to understand that discipling starts in the family. Yeah. Starts in the family. I believe every husband should have a family devotional time with their family. 
And we fall short sometimes in this and things get busy. But I find one of the temptations I know for me is like you take your family for granted. And it starts out of a place of love. You just kind of know they're, they're not going. I mean, I know Chanel's just loyal. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't really have to worry about it, quote, unquote. And, but that can go to a place then of, like, you just start not taking care of it. Yeah. Right. And then you're like, oh, I've got all these D times with everybody else in the church. But then you're letting your own family start to drift. Ooh, yeah. Come on. And so I've got to ask the husbands in the church, do you have a D time, a discipleship time with your spouse? where you sit down and you open the Bible and then you bring your kids in at some point and you have a, a devotional time with your kids and you're teaching them the word of God. And, and I love it, but, but we've had fun with Bell and me before where we've done family devotionals where, you know, get a, it's easy stuff. You just kind of, I just think of it last minute usually, you know, like just get a box. That's Noah's Ark, you know, we're going to find all the stuffed animals around the house and throw them in there and then have a little lesson. Or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and you want to raise your kids in the way of the Lord. It's not the campus minister's responsibility. It's not the youth minister's responsibility. It's not the kid's kingdom. When they, you stand before God, it's going to go, did I train and disciple my children in the Lord? Now, if you go to Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to look in verse 22. Sadly, sometimes cultures even impacted translations of the Bible. Yeah. Now, I'm not trying to cause people to doubt the Bible or anything like that. It's just... It's just the reality is all the ways it's broken up and the headings and different things like that uh, were done by people, us. And it's helpful because it kind of breaks it down in sections. I'm, I'm grateful for it. But you'll notice it's very interesting in all translations of the Bible until recently, the new ones. Verse, Ephesians 5 verse 21 used to be set up with Ephesians 5.20 above in that section. But they've dropped the heading to be above verse 21 to try to include where it says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ to try to make it more equal footing that well the husband has to submit to the wife too and it's lost the context where verse 21 is actually referring back to being filled with the spirit and in our communal sense of fellowship I mean that's what Ephesians 4 is talking about the church being one body and, and all of our roles we all have to have a humility before one another are you with me right here and then he shifts to the subject of marriage. And it's not like verse 21 is all just going to contradict verse 22. He's talking about a different ordering here. And verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is a savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in some things. Husbands. Okay, just make sure you're paying attention. Everything, amen. Other brothers are like, yeah, preach that, bro. Well, we're not off the hook yet, amen. But sisters, I, I, I do want to encourage you. Do you submit to your husband in everything? And, or do we allow culture to influence us? Do we get manipulative? You know, God gave Adam the office and... Eve the influence. Man's been given the office and woman's been given the influence. And you say, well, that's not fair. Well, influence is, is sometimes more powerful than office. Wars have been lost because of a, a woman's influence. Women are powerful. But what happens a lot of times is if you use your influence for evil and you're constantly being like Jezebel in the Bible and trying to like just manipulate your husband and, and beat him down, what happened with Ahab in the Bible? He was just this sullen character that was just kind of beat down and finally just kind of, I'm just going to let my wife run things because that's easier. That's easier. And it is. Leadership's tough. And I think for sisters, we need to understand that, that uh, you may think your husband does nothing, that they carry the weight of the world of their family on their shoulders every single day. And that's got to be honored, respected, and we need to go, I've got to follow Jesus Christ. Now, here's a challenge. He says, submit to your husband as the church submits to Christ. So one thing that helps is when you're struggling in your marriage, you got to go, would I act this way with Jesus Christ as my husband? Woo! Getting, getting this tough, huh? I like looking at people's faces while I'm preaching. Just kind of like, <laughs> who's really struggling with this one? Um, let's read on for the guys here. In verse 22, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy and cleansing her through the washing with water through the word. You know, that, that, that's like a nice, like, warm bath, you know? 
That's what I kind of think of. It's not like a beat down with the word of God. Right? You got to inspire your wife. And the Bible says here in verse 27 to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Amen? So husbands, it's our responsibility to be willing to die for our wives, to sacrifice for them. Um, there is a place of, uh, that, that can come for, for giving up different things you want to do to make them radiant and happy. Amen? I listen to my wife. I want her influence. She makes me a better man of God. I, I ask her what she thinks about things because I value her input. Amen. But there are times I just go, amen, I appreciate that. That's not what we're going to do. And I get to reap the consequences later if it was stupid. Amen? <laughs> and you know the thing I appreciate about Chanel? It's not like I told you so, you idiot, or whatever. <laughs> He's like, I'm with you. You know what I mean? And, and, and it's awesome. It's awesome. But husbands, do you disciple your wives? You know, for shepherds in the church, being a shepherd or being an elder, or, and I'm not preaching to our shepherds. I'm just saying being a shepherd or an elder is a requirement is to be a leader of your wife, to be faithful to your wife. That, that verse encompasses so much more than just, um, you know, you're married. But, but what's your marriage like at home? Are there, are there D times? Is there intimacy? Is there a, a relationship? Do people look and go, man, that's a relationship I want. That's a marriage I want. And I believe discipling is what brings us this. And this is why as married couples, we need discipling from other married couples. And we need to open up our, our lives. And sometimes we can get the Ananias and Sapphira effect where we want to kind of keep everything behind closed doors. And I won't go into that, but you know what happened to them. They died, you know? Because... They, they didn't want to be open. They had a sin pact with their spouse. And, and that, that's never good. I know for me in my own life, I've had to watch how I talk about even the church around my spouse. And here's the thing. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, the wife is the weaker partner. So sometimes I can come back from a day in the ministry and go, I can't believe brother so-and-so is doing this and thinking that I'm just kind of offloading because I feel safe and secure. And then I quickly get over it. And, and now I've just made my wife struggle, though. Because my wife's going to fight for me, amen? She's like, that's an injustice. I, we're, I, I'm going to take this guy out, you know? And then now I'm like, oh, babe, please, come on. Like, I'm trying to, you know? So I'm just saying we've got to be really wise. The man needs to be the rock in his home. And for those of you that are single, you got to carefully consider who you date. Because you got to look at their relationship. Do they submit to their discipleship partner? Because if they don't, they're not, you're going to be trapped when you're married to that person. They're not going to care about getting help or anything like that. And then you're stuck with them because God hates divorce. Now, let me get into the sermon, amen? Mark chapter 10 and verse 45 Why did Jesus come? Yes, to seek and to save the lost. But I love there's another passage that says why he came. And Mark 10, verse 45, I'll just quote it here. It says that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. Jesus, who had all authority, he's God, came to serve. Yeah. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Come on, bro. Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be all over the Bible today. And Philippians 2 in verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. I like the old translation, have the attitude of Christ. Yeah. So there's a disposition we carry ourselves with as Christians. Verse 6, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death and even death on a cross. Is that awesome? Yes. Wow. God was not into titles or roles. He goes, I didn't consider equality with this position that I do have with God anything. In fact, I'm going to make myself nothing. And this is true humility. Now, the Greek's really interesting here. This will change the way you read the Bible if you understand this. The verse literally can be translated that he emptied himself in the Greek. What, what's this mean? Sometimes I think we think Jesus was like God in the sense on earth, that he was like divine. And so like 
when he's really praying to God, he's actually just praying to himself, and like he's, you know, it didn't really hurt on the cross because he's supernatural and just kind of like acted like it maybe or, or whatever. No, the Bible, guys, is saying that Jesus emptied himself of his divinity. Not that he wasn't divine, but of the right to use divinity. So every miracle he did on earth was based on his faith and his prayer life. Not just like zap, 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 I can read your mind, blah, blah, blah. He was fully human. And he chose to empty himself and become fully human. And so when he's wrestling in the garden, praying and sweating drops of blood, he's really wrestling. He's being tempted. He's not doing the cheat code. You know, I'm already God, so it doesn't matter. No, he, he's, I'm a man praying to God for strength. Humility. Do you make yourself nothing? Often in life, things will be totally out of your control. And we've got to have the heart to go, I'm surrendered. I'm submissive. And I think discipling is what helps us get there. He made himself a servant. You know, I always feel like it's sad when we need people to do kids' kingdom teaching. And it's like, pull, draw, you know, just trying to pull strings just to get somebody to get in there. Because they've come to be served and not to serve. Or when people don't stick around after church to help clean up or be in someone's house and eat their food and then just take off. These are the types of things we got to go, guys, why have we come? We need to come to church to serve. We need to be like Jesus. We need to have a heart that's willing to give and not this consumer mindset that can come into Christianity. Now, I... Uh, my favorite discipling relationship in the Bible outside of uh, Jesus and God, and Jesus and God had a discipling relationship. Uh, as I said, he prayed to him. He was mentored by God, and that's a whole other study we could do, but I think it's really cool because it shows discipling is not just like a counseling therapy session every week. And sometimes discipling can turn into like a Catholic kind of confessional thing where it's like I store up all my problems and everything I want to just kind of vomit on somebody, and then we meet and we just talk about that every week. And it's like the same thing every week. Wow. Jesus, the Bible says, learned obedience from God. Never sinned. But that discipling relationship was based on winning others to Christ. You see, fundamentally, our discipling is to be training each other to win the world. And that's what I love spending D times about. And we'll see later. We should have a daily relationship. So you're talking about sin already. You're confessing things and stuff. But, but we've got work to do. Amen, guys? In the IE. Yeah. Now, my favorite discipling relationship outside of Jesus and God is Elijah and Elisha. And if you go to 1 Kings chapter 19. Come on, bro. 1 Kings chapter 19. As you're turning there, I want you to understand discipling was crucial to the early church's growth. They did not have a Bible, guys, in the early church in the first century. Um, and only rich members did. A few of them did. Wealthy people that had the scrolls and stuff. And so... Remember, they had to actually rely on discipleship at a level we never will understand. Wow. To be able to bring the word of God to somebody. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, in verse 19, we find the beginning of the discipling relationship between Elijah, with a J, and Elisha. Amen? And it says in verse 19, So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elisha went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I'll come with you. Go back, Elisha replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. This is radical. Elijah's the man of God. He has the cloak or what's known as the mantle. And, and this is the, the sign of discipleship, if you will, that you're calling somebody to follow you and learn the ways of the Lord. And he comes. He says, here, follow me. And Elisha goes, well, I want to go back first and say goodbye to my family. And we know from the discipleship study that's a no-go. Are you with me right here? He goes, dude, you're putting your family before God and God's man? What have I done to you to deserve this? And Elisha's smart. He goes back to his family, and he goes, no, watch this. He burns the family business. 
destroys the equipment to show he's all in. I'm not going back. I have nothing to return to. Amen. And he gives the food because he wants to be loving towards his family. Amen. But he comes back and he's all in. He's committing to this relationship. For a great discipling relationship to work, you've got to commit to the relationship. Say, I'm not leaving. I'm not going back. We get, you know, you're going to get hurt in, in human relationships. But there's a commitment to fight for it. I appreciated the contribution today. I, I, I thought that was awesome. I, I was like, you know, this is good. Part of our giving is our relationships are reconciled together and we're unified. At whatever cost. You know, in 2 Kings chapter 3, look at the heart of this guy. And notice what it said, Elijah, uh, Elisha became his servant. Now, the word servant is minister. And most translations will say minister. We think of a minister as like me, I'm your guys' minister. But actually, minister in the Bible, you're a minister to the people that disciple you. So you're a servant. So Elisha ministered to Elijah, meaning part of a discipling relationship is serving those who mentor you. And this is one is, a, is another challenging teaching. Why? Because they're pouring out so much to you to make you great and serving you. I like this little verse. This is kind of random, but in 2 Kings 3, verse 11. Come on, bro. Just look at it. We just get a glimpse in their relationship here. Uh, verse 11, it says, But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire the Lord? An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elisha. And that, that, that means pour water. Some translations, you know, that washed his hands. And so he served him by washing his hands. It's crazy. For the 22 years before Elisha ever first prophesied, he just served. Just served. I, myself, am a servant first to God and to Jesus Christ, of course. But I'm a servant to Jason Dimitri. He's my mentor. He's my discipler. I'm not confused about that. Uh, it's not my role to be his minister in the, or his overseer. It's my role to be his minister and to serve him and to learn from him. And the problem in our society is everyone wants to be bosses instead of servants. And you can't be Paul until you're first a, a Timothy. And, you know, for, for me, I, I've had great discipling relationships, and then I've discipled other people that are just a challenging. There are nice people that you will disciple, but they're actually not really good disciples. They're just, they're just agreeable. I remember one guy I used to disciple all the time. I'd say, hey, bro, why don't you do this or try this? And he'd be like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. Yeah, I actually was thinking that the other day, and I started doing that every single time for everything. And I was just like, dude, and we, we talked about it. I'm like, bro, you're, you know, you're agreeable to everything, but you don't actually really follow direction. <laughs> and with the cops, we've been having this uh, campaign that we've been doing. And cops, if you're visiting with us, is not like police force. It's, it's a, a company of profits, what it stands for. And I told them, I, you know, I actually expect you to do what I say. Uh, it's not like just an idea or like a suggestion or, or something that we're just kind of you know, if you feel like it or you get time to be a part of this group, you got to be willing to be discipled by me. You don't have to be discipled by me. Right. You don't have to be a part of that group. But if you're going to be a part of it, we're going to build something really awesome. Come on, Mike. But, but a few of them, I, I've got my running list, are going to get, they're getting a rude awakening here really soon. Because they're missing it, don't care, you know, here and there. So I'm like, we don't do that. <laughs> and this is, Elisha's heart was, I've burned everything. I've destroyed everything to be with you. I, 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 I'm here. I want to learn your heart and your life. How much do you prioritize the man or woman of God in your life? Wow. Come on, um, I'll be in a Bible study. I'll be talking to someone. And there's only two people I'll pick up for the phone with in my life and interrupt that meeting. It's my wife or my discipler, Jason Dimitri. I'm not rude or anything. I just go, oh, excuse me for a moment. But because he takes priority in my life, this is the person God has put into my life to teach me to obey. Amen. Discipling will make you a better husband. Yeah. It'll make you a better spouse, a better wife, a better athlete, a better student. And if you don't like this or this makes you uncomfortable, you don't understand basic discipleship. And you want an American version of Christianity that's not Christianity at all. And the man of God will drive you at times. They will push you. 
Um, I love in 2 Kings chapter 2, uh, for time, I'll, uh, you just write it down. But in chapter 2, verse 1 through 6, Elijah tries to fire him three times. He, he goes, hey, you stay here. I'm going to move on. And Elisha's going, no, I'm coming with you. Amen. And three times he tries to get rid of him. But he's not getting rid of him. You know, I think a lot of us go, well, you don't understand. My discipler doesn't return my phone calls. My discipler doesn't meet with me and have weekly deed times. you got to be like Elisha and go, you're not getting rid of me, dude. We don't try hard enough. That's why we have shepherds and leaders in the church and stuff. And you can pull people in and say, hey, I'm just not getting discipled. And, and, it's, and I don't want to struggle with bitterness towards the guy God's put in my life. But I need help. And, and then on Sunday, you can trap them when they're there. You know what I'm talking about? And pull them aside in the fellowship and go, what's going on? We need to understand. People go through things, and there will be distance at times. And Elijah was a man of God, but he had incredible pressures on him. But the thing I appreciate about Elisha is he went after it. And this is why 12-step groups are so effective, like AA, because you have a sponsor. But guess what? It's not like in our church culture, I think sometimes we teach it's like it's on the sponsee, which would be like the discipler to like call them every day and reach out to them and stuff. And certainly that's true. But in their group, it's on the sponsee, the person being sponsored to reach out. Because here's the thing. You're not going to change and give up alcohol if you actually don't really want to reach out. No one can do that for you. And fundamentally, you have to want to be discipled. It's not going to work. If you're just waiting on someone else to do your Christianity for you, wow. you got to want to be discipled. Amen. Um, I love uh, uh, discipling, and I think there's a sense of honor that, that comes with discipling um, in a lot of ways because honor is a lost concept in our society, too. And this is the second point is discipling involves honor. It, just, it involves honor. Imagine if, if for you sisters, maybe you were got chosen to be an intern of Beyonce or something like that, right? <laughs> You'd just be fired up. I mean, you, you see these people, they'd be like, oh, my gosh, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up your, your nail clippings or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just excited to be in front of Beyonce or whatever. Or, or, or maybe you're into politics. You, you're excited to be the, the, the you know, intern of the president of the United States or something like that. Um, and, and you're just fired up. But here's the thing, guys. You get to be an intern to a man of God. And, and a, a man of God, man, that's awesome. I don't know about you, but when Kip or Jason come around or something, I, I, I'm like, there's like this nervous fear, but it's like an exciting nervous fear. I'm not talking about an unhealthy, I'm afraid of you, I'm not going to share what's going on in my life. It's not what we're talking about. Come on, Mike. I'm talking about just like an honor. I, I, I want to make things great for them because yeah. they've done so much for the Lord. Are you with me right here? And we've lost that honor in our society. You know, um, in Exodus chapter 16, Exodus 16 and verse 1. Something that happens after we get baptized sometimes is uh, we start to miss the world. And this is why discipling is so crucial because it keeps our eyes focused on Christ. We can actually miss our slavery, but a lot of that's just because of what, that's just what we were used to. And in Exodus 16 verse 1 it says, The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin. It doesn't sound good already which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Oh, man. Well, what was going on here? They're struggling. Now, you're going to find, I think they're struggling because they only have one guy available that can meet all their needs at this point. No discipling really going on. Only Moses is the one that's meeting all their needs. They don't have someone keeping their eyes focused on God. To remind them, dude, you remember when you made all these pyramid-type structures with, like, no straw? You remember how bad that was? And you want to go back and be a slave? And so in their mind, they started to romanticize the world again, that it looks so good and nice. And, and we can do that as Christians. But that's why we need someone in our lives. Now, if you go on, it's interesting because the Bible says here in verse uh, 8, Moses said, you will know that the Lord is good and he gives you meat to eat in the evening and the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. 
to grumble against God's leadership is to grumble against God. And again, I think we think we're entitled sometimes to just complain. And, and there's a difference between complaining and grumbling and faithful solutions. Yeah. Faithful on. solutions. Now, what happened in Exodus chapter 18, turn over there. So we got this dire kind of situation, and it gets more worse, you know. Moses finally just kind of loses it, you know, and, and hits the rock, and it's just all bad. You know, when you don't have discipling going on in the church, the, 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 the preacher's not going to last long. It, it just, they're just going to, Moses literally didn't get to see the promised land because he just got too angry, too upset. And in Exodus chapter 18, you guys still with me? Verse, 12, verse 13. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing to the people, he said, what is this you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you alone. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him, teaching them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times. And the word judge, by the way, can just be translated leader as well. Um, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases you can decide for yourselves. That will make your load lighter because you will share, uh, it will, uh, share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you'll be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. And the church said, Amen. and we want a church where every person is satisfied. Come on. Every person's fed spiritually, and they're happy, and they're not thinking about going back to Egypt. But now, a godly man comes to his life, goes, hey, what you're doing is not good. You need to select capable leaders who love the Lord, who fear God, who can disciple these groups of people. Are you with me right here? And that's what we've done in our church. Um, we have Chanel and I, who lead the super region. Uh, we disciple a couple of uh, uh, incredible region leader couples with Lou Jack and Kathy and Scott and Sandy Lundy. It's an incredible shepherding team. Um, and, and it's amazing to think about these people have dedicated themselves and they've been selected because they are trustworthy and they know what they're doing. We've selected Bible talk leaders. A Bible talk leader, guys, is an incredible responsibility in the church. Because you're like on the ground floor, floor unit, if you will, out there fighting the, 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 the satanic attacks against your people. You're a shepherd to that group. But here's the thing. One thing I need is I need the Bible talk leaders to really own their groups. And they have to have a conviction. they got to get back to me. Are you with me right here? When there's direction being given, this is how we're going to operate. So I don't fall away and get overwhelmed. Amen. But also so you can be satisfied and every single person in your group can be satisfied. But a lot of it takes a lot of trust. Never forget that the men of God are just that, men of God. And you got to be able to separate the man from God. Right. It's the office that we respect. It's the office that God has given them that authority that we give honor to. I love in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 7 through 14, you write it down. But towards the end of Elijah's life, he's going to be taken up to heaven by a whirlwind. And Elisha, he goes, just give me a double portion of your spirit. Now, the double portion in the Old Testament went to the firstborn son. And that would be the first, uh, the inheritance uh, would be, uh, uh, he'd receive the double portion of the inheritance would go to the firstborn son. So when Elisha's saying this, he's saying, I want a double portion, not of your possessions and your materials, but of your spirit, of your very heart, of who you are. I like Luke 6, verse 39 through 40, where it says, A student is not as above his teacher until he's fully trained. He becomes just like his teacher. Yeah. Every group has a spirit about it. It's the spirit of its leader. Yeah. Um, every denomination has the spirit of its leader, whether it's the Lutherans and Martin Luther, right? Whether it's 
It's the Methodists and John Wesley. There's, there's a spirit there. We even in our movement, we have the spirit of our leader. There's a culture there. There's kind of a, he got converted in a fraternity. There's kind of a zeal fired up, kind of you know, all the symbols. You know, we, we have a culture about us as a church, and that's awesome. We need to understand that the Bible says in Hosea, like people, like priest. And so as the people go, it's the result of the leader. Because the leadership is the ceiling of the church. We want to have a double portion of those who are discipling us in the Christ-like ways. That's got to be our heart if we have that kind of discipling and friendship and love. For me, I want to live for another man's glory so that God can be glorified in his plan, in his perfect plan of discipling and discipleship. Um, If you'll go to 2 Kings chapter 5. Second Kings chapter 5. If you can't serve the man of God, how could God entrust you with souls? God doesn't want men and women that are going to lord it over people, be harsh. He wants servants. Moses and Joshua had a great discipling relationship because Joshua was, was able to continue his ministry. But God will destroy you if you forsake the man of God. Go read about Korah. And his rebellion, you remember that? Yeah. The earth opens up and swallows them. A lot of people don't realize the literal text in the Hebrew reads that they went straight to hell, like in bodily form. Like just. Yeah. Um, then think about Aaron and Miriam. Yeah. Remember that? Got a little, little, little racist there, and he made them turn white. You know, I mean, God's like, I'm not dealing with this. Wow. He just rebellion. That was intense. In Second Kings chapter five and verse twenty. We got another guy that's uh, not a great example. It says here, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha. So this was uh, the guy Elisha was discipling, Gehazi. Said to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman the Armenian by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? He asked. Everything's all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. So what's going on here? Elisha had just healed this guy named Naaman, dipped him, baptized him seven times in a river, and his leprosy was healed. And Usually in that time, you know, it was something miraculous like that. You would, you would get paid for it. But Elisha's like, no, nah, you know, I don't really need this full cost. And they moved on. Gehazi thinks, no, we need that. And I'm going to go back and get it. My master just doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> so he lacks the humility to really trust his disciple here at this point and runs ahead of him. And then he starts lying. <laughs> now, look at what it says in verse uh, when he comes back. And verse 25 says, when he went and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? <laughs> Good discipler always gives his disciple a chance to confess and repent. <laughs> he says, your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks or herds or male or female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and his skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. Woo! Wow! What are you taking into your own hands right now that you got to let go of? And give to God. I don't have time to go into the kids who made fun of Elijah's bald head, and the bears came out and mauled him. Jesus said of Judas that it would have been better for him to never been born. God takes rebellion seriously. I'll never forget one brother saying of his discipler, um, a preacher, he said about him, he goes, I, you know, I, I don't really ever take anything away from his sermons. I just was kind of trashing him. And this guy was in ICCM. And I knew from that day, you will never finish. This is not going to work out for you. And it never did. Wow. Never did. I listen very carefully to how people talk about people. Because you can hear honor in people's mouths. You can hear slights. You can see in people's disposition one of honor or not or dishonor. 
And it's important to understand. Honor is such a huge part of discipling. It makes discipling attractive and inspiring because it's so different from the world. Absalom and Solomon. Absalom and Solomon had the same father. The difference between them is one chose to honor his father and the other didn't. Uh, you could have the best discipler in the world and still not honor. Demas was discipled by Paul but left for the world and fell away. Uh, prisons, they're full of people who just simply never learn to honor. That's it. I believe every sin is one of, of honor. Uh, all the first four Ten Commandments are honoring God, and the last are about honoring each other. The one difference between your present and your future is simply who you decide to start honoring. Um, I believe I'm a byproduct of honor. I, the, I, the only reason I'm standing before you is because I've honored the right people that God's put in my life. Amen. And honor will cover your sins. Honor will cover your sins. Where people that don't practice honor, their sins will still be in on them in the eyes of people. But honor will cover your sins. Uh, we're taught, sadly, obedience at the threat of loss or pain. But when we understand honor, it can cover our sins and make us more righteous people. It's what caused Pharaoh to make Joseph over all of Egypt in less than 10 verses in the Bible. Because he chose to honor. And I believe if you looked at your life right now and you trace all your losses, wow. you'll trace them to a moment of dishonor. Wow. I believe it's part of why our former fellowship fell away. That's very true. There was a loss of honor to the offices that God had set up. Yeah. And because of that, it fell apart. Yeah. And it's sad. You ever apply the, the, a great passage to the wrong situation? Yeah. A lot of people think even with leadership in the Bible, you know in 1 Timothy 5, you're not supposed to Matthew 18, your leaders. Did you know that? The Bible says there needs to be two or more witnesses to bring even a charge before an elder or a shepherd. Matthew 18 is just for everyone else. That, that's how serious God takes leadership. A lot of you guys are shocked right now. You're like, look, 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 what are we talking about here? It's because we've drifted so far from what the scriptures teach when it comes about honor. And you never forget dishonor. I mean, you, you can probably remember times when people just disrespected you and, and didn't honor you. You know what I mean? And it, it, sticks with, it sticks with you. So I want to encourage us to be a ministry that honors people. You know, for a lot of us, um, we try to get by on our talent and our skills, but we lack a heart of honor. I'll never forget, I put a brother in the ministry one time. He was one of the most talented guys I, I ever knew. But I was young and foolish, and I didn't see that he didn't honor those around him. And so it didn't matter about his resume. Listen, Satan had a great resume in heaven. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Lucifer had a good resume, but he didn't honor God. And fundamentally what pride is, is wanting to be on the throne and be in control instead of being able to remove yourself. You know, I want to encourage us today, honor those who are discipling you. Amen. What do you do if you don't like your discipling partner or you don't feel like they're meeting your needs or that sort of thing? You submit to it. And you trust. There's been guys, I remember I had a discipler one time, and all he did, I, I can remember one D time with him. And we just sat in his car, and he was a radio DJ in the city I lived in, and he just showed me all this music, and that was it. And, and I struggled, but I was like, what's God teaching me right now? <clears throat> well, God's put this person in my life, maybe to make me a little bit more fun. <laughs> and like music, and loosen up a little bit. <laughs> God's put this person in my life, his absence teaches me to reach out to others. And to reach out to God. And so we need to have a faithful spirit. And finally, guys, the last point is discipling's practical. Discipling's practical. Uh, I want to close in two scriptures. Go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And verse 12. And we'll get a little practical here. So in verse 12 it says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another on Sundays. As, no, I got, man, you're still paying attention. Daily, right? As long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You see, it only takes one day. I mean, in my experience, almost like an hour for your heart to get hard. Yeah. Wrong guy cuts you off on the road there. Disciple says something mean to you, and you're just like, what in the world? A spouse forgot to bring the milk home, or whatever, you know? And it's just like, my heart is hard. 
And the Bible says that we need daily discipling. Now, we get faked out. We think, it says, oh, encourage one another. So I just got to bring cookies and nice cards and all this kind of stuff. In the Greek, it can translate, and other translations translate it like this, but exhort one another. Exhorts the idea of it involves encouragement sometimes, admonishment sometimes, rebuke sometimes, because our hearts get hardened by sin. And we live in a sinful world, and there's none of us that don't need discipling. I've never been 38 and had a daughter that's four and been married for 11 years at the, until this stage, on this date. It's all new to me. And so I need discipling. I need advice, and I need help. Sin is so dangerous because it hardens the heart. And you think about the way they kill wolves in Alaska is they'll take like a bucket of water and they'll get cow's blood and they'll put it, uh, the Eskimos will put it on like a knife and they'll put it in the water so that the water like freezes around the knife. And then they'll stick, you know, pull the block of ice out with the knife in it and the wolves will sense this blood. And that's kind of how temptation is. Isn't that like sin? You kind of just sense it and you feel it sometimes and you're kind of like, okay. And they, they get drawn to it, and they start licking the ice because they want to try to get to that blood. But what happens is as they lick that ice, and they lick that ice, their tongue becomes numb, and they can't feel anymore. And eventually, they, they melt the ice down, licking it until their tongue hits the blade of the knife with the cow blood on it. And then they start getting the cow blood. They start tasting it, and they don't realize their own blood is pouring out, getting mixed with this. And so they're just kind of in this ravenous rage, and then they die, and they bleed out. And that's what sin does, isn't it? Lick that impurity, and you lick it again, and you lick it again, and you lick it again, and soon your heart's hard, and you don't feel anymore. You go, I don't want my discipler telling me what to do anymore. And you don't trust people that see you're blind, and you need help, and you need exhortation in your life. When's the last time you just got a good D time and challenged somebody in the Lord? You know, we think, oh, we don't want to challenge people because they might fall away. No, they fall away because they're not challenged. That's the truth. And so maybe there needs to be some conversations that need to happen today. We're going to have some great food afterwards here, amen? And you have a great D time with someone. But I want to challenge you to be bold in your discipling. And maybe there's a broken relationship. Don't just rely on other people to deal with it for you because you're a coward. Go and attempt to deal with it first, being real. And then we'll all be there to help you. Are you with me right here? Encourage one another daily. There's over 60, about 61 another passages in the Bible. Love one another, John 13, 34. As Jesus loved us, meaning we've got to be willing to die for each other. Not based on, you know, if we like each other's personality. I mean, sometimes we say silly things like, well, I love that person. I just don't like them. And I always ask the person, I go, okay, what if Jesus like loved you but didn't like you? That wouldn't be very fun. And so we, we got to be willing to love each other and fellowship in a way where we're, there's a self-sacrificial. It doesn't matter how late, what call, you know, we need. We're willing to go out of our way to help each other. The Bible says in Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. There's a devotion to one another. Romans 15, 14, instruct and admonish one another. You know, the Bible teaches in that passage that every Christian is capable of discipling each other. So I go, well, why is this guy, he just got baptized a month ago. Why is he discipling me? I've been around for 10 years. Yeah. You got a pride problem. Because you think you can't learn from somebody. And I get it, guys. That, those situations are hard. It's not like it's easy or something. And I think we have to talk through those things. But I'm just saying at the end of the day, when nothing changes, is your heart going to be fired up and submissive to God? Serve one another in love. Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another. How about this one, James 5, 16, confess your sins to one another? Carrying anything that needs to be talked about? How do you fulfill all these? Discipling. The last scripture is in Colossians 1. Come on, Colossians. In uh, Colossians 1, and this is the goal of discipling. Now, we need to disciple the whole man. Sometimes it's just like Matthew 28 and... Malachi 3, you know what I mean? All the time. Just give your contribution and, and make disciples. <laughs> and then we wonder, why is the church like so immature, or don't have you know, good jobs or promoting in the world and stuff? Uh -huh. Anyway, I've got a sermon on the Great Commission today, you know? And it's kind of like, okay, in discipling, we need to know our Bibles. Yeah. And we need to teach through the Bible. 
And I want to encourage you, if you haven't started this year and you've never read the Bible in an entire year, read it. you got to oh, know this thing cover to cover so that you can have something to share with someone and talk them with about. Now, here's the thing. you got to disciple people that get mad you're preaching Matthew 28 again. Because I like to go, oh, cool, okay, I, I'm sorry that's offensive to you. Uh, when's the last time you made a disciple? Because oftentimes the things that offend us are the things we're not doing. And, and, and we can get mad at all the young leaders that are still learning how to preach and, they're, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Or we can have a good heart and go, man, am I really practicing this stuff? Let me appreciate the zeal this person has. Maybe he said something kind of out of context, wrong. Hey, man, we can talk about that. But I'm going to have a great heart and get behind what God's doing. In Colossians 1, 28, here's the goal of discipling. Paul writes to the church talking about Christ, he's the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. It says it takes work to disciple, guys. Yeah. It's hard. Being a Christian, your life's busier than the world. Yeah. There's just way more going on. Yeah. But Paul goes, you know something? I don't even have my own strength anymore. I wrestle with the energy Christ gives me, Amen. Because he poured himself out. And what was his goal? He said, I want to present you perfect in Christ. Come on. That word perfect can be translated mature. It's the idea of complete. So if you don't know what to do a D time on, you want to look at Jesus, and you look at the person you're discipling, and then you look back at Jesus, and you go, go what are all the ways they're like Jesus? Right. They need, we need encouragement in this dark world. Amen. What are all the ways they're like Christ? And I would put before you, you should have more of that than that the ways they're not like Christ. Come on, Mike. Yeah. Jesus, I, I don't remember if, I pre, if I'm being redundant. I shared this with somebody the other day. But Jesus rebuked waves, demons, Pharisees, and one-time Peter. Wow. So we throw that around a lot. Like, oh, man, I'm going to rebuke this guy when I go. It's like, <gasps> really, dude? Like, you probably don't need that yet. Right. We just need a good talk in the Lord, some admonishment, some strengthening. So you look at the ways they could grow to become more like Christ, and, and that's, your, that's your D time. You put together a study about it. Maybe you look at some scriptures. There are times for D times where you just hang out and build a friendship and uh, go out to eat or go see a movie and stuff. But don't do so many things where you don't have the word of God involved anymore. Are you with me right here? And there's a place for discipling groups. I know for us, we disciple so many people that we're going to alternate where we have discipling groups and then we meet with individuals. But that's how Jesus discipled his guys. Amen? And so brothers and sisters... We need to disciple the whole man, not just the evangelism, not just the giving, but we got to disciple people in their purity. Got to ask the right questions. How's it going? You, and you got to ask questions because oftentimes we hide the things that, that we're ashamed of. But it could save our very soul if you ask the right question. How are their quiet times going? How's their alcohol consumption? How's their health going? Have yeah. they, if someone hasn't seen a doctor in forever, what's going on? Can, can we use some scriptures? The Bible says physical training is of some value, bro. Right. Yeah. And I'm concerned you're gaining weight. Or whatever. These are talks we got to have with each other to yeah. make each other more like Christ. Sometimes there's people that are just, they get baptized and amen, bless their heart. They didn't have a lot of friends in the world and they're just kind of weird and they weird people out in the church. <laughs> but guess what? That's what's great. You're loved by Christ. And God can even change that to make you a more social person. I'm a total nerd and loser in the world. I really was. And still am in a lot of ways. But people discipled me on how to be more social. Come on, Mike. Come on. Finances, we need discipling on. Are you willing to share your, your, your finances with someone and get help? Marriage. We all have blind spots. And so my call today is, one, discipling, it's servitude. Make a decision. I'm going to serve the person that's discipling me. I'm going to be a joy to them. Come on. Number two, we saw discipling involves honor. Let's honor discipling again in God's movement, on, where we really can bear that name, the sold-out discipling movement. And finally, discipling's practical. And so here's the call. This week, have a great discipleship time with the person who disciples you, and have a great discipleship time with the person you're discipling. Now you go, oh, I don't disciple anybody. Well, then you got to go obey Jesus and find someone to disciple. Because discipling begins before baptism, amen? And that's why we're doing the Jumpstart January campaign, because we want to go and disciple the nation so the world can be one for Christ. And to God be the glory, amen?